This week we are turning our attention to a method of cryptography that is likely the most commonly used today because it provides a way to secure a variety of communications traffic. We will discuss the methodology of how it is implemented, provide some simple real-world examples to give you a clear understanding of its usage, and provide a way for you to practice using this encryption on your own. Public key cryptography provides a means of securely communicating with others by providing a corresponding set of keys that allows for the encrypting and decrypting of messages. Some forms of encryption use only one key to encrypt and decrypt, and that key must be safeguarded in order to protect the information it is used to encrypt. So sharing that key with someone else can be difficult because the key itself could be stolen in transit. The public key version makes this process a little easier by generating a set of keys that can be used in conjunction with each other without the need to send sensitive keys to the people you need to communicate with. Each user generates a set of keys using a program and then uploads the public key to a server accessible by anyone they want to communicate with. The private key remains private, and only the user who generated the keys should have access to it. The beauty to this system is that anything encrypted with the public key can be decrypted by the corresponding private key. The public key can be shared with everyone, but without the private key, any eavesdroppers will not be able to decrypt the messages. Now, most people who use this method within an organization have someone who helps them generate the keys and then the process is pretty transparent from there. Its most common use is in sending encrypted emails. The way public key cryptography works can sometimes be confusing when looking at the technical details of what is happening in the background. So let's look at a simple example to help visualize the basic concept. If you have two people who want to communicate with each other We'll use Bob and Betty for this example. And Bob wants to send a message to Betty, but it's a secret, so he doesn't want anyone else to see it. With public key cryptography, Bob can download a copy of Betty's public key, encrypt his message using that key, and then send the message to Betty in an encrypted state. This will protect the message in transit, and if anyone is able to get a copy of the message, they will not be able to read it. Now when Betty receives the message, she will be able to decrypt it using her corresponding private key and then read the unencrypted version of the message. Betty can also respond to Bob by using his public key and Bob will use his private key to decrypt and read the message. The nice thing is that all of this public and private key stuff happens in the background and is mostly transparent to the user if everything is configured correctly. This public key system is known as asymmetric because it uses a pair of keys. Encryption that uses a single key is known as symmetric. Now here's an analogy that compares the two. If Bob wants to send a secret package to Betty through the mail, he can place the contents into a box and secure it with a padlock. When Betty receives the package, she can unlock the padlock using a copy of the key that Bob previously gave her. This is how symmetric key encryption works. But as you can see, Bob would have to have a way to send the key to Betty as well. And anyone along that path could potentially open the package, copy the key, then reseal and send the package on to Betty. This would compromise the key and anything sent in the future. So asymmetric cryptography is the safer method. Betty could instead send an open padlock to Bob while she retains the only key that can open it. Bob can use that padlock to secure the package and send it back to Betty. Now Betty can use the only available key to open the package. In this analogy, the padlock is the public key and the padlock key is the private key. The private key remains private throughout the process. 
Because this system is mostly automated and transparent to the user, it is incredibly simple to use and allows for worldwide communication between anyone. The public key can literally be stored anywhere. Anyone can have access to it because it is not that valuable without the private key. But the most important piece of this process is that the private key needs to remain private. If it is ever compromised, a new set of keys will need to be generated and the old set of keys will need to be expired so that they are no longer used. This will also mean that any messages sent using the old public key will no longer be decryptable by the new key. So it can create a few problems if the key is compromised. Some organizations also have the practice of manually expiring and reissuing keys on a regular cycle just to make a fresh set of keys available in case a private key was compromised without anyone knowing. This is similar to credit card companies issuing new card numbers when a card is lost. It's a just-in-case method of security. And we'll talk more about the management side of these keys in a later lecture. Now let's look at the security of these keys against an attacker. An attacker could conceivably monitor network traffic leaving an organization and grab a copy of the encrypted message as it leaves. Now let's be clear. This attacker could be anybody. It could be a criminal trying to steal information. It could be someone involved in corporate espionage. Or it could even be a law enforcement officer with a warrant to monitor communications. I'm making this distinction so you understand that good encryption will provide protection no matter who is listening to the conversation. So the attacker could get a copy of the message, but they won't be able to read it. At the most, they could delete the message so it never arrives, or modify the encrypted content so that it is unreadable when it arrives. On the other hand, if the attacker had a copy of the private key, the scenario completely changes. With the private key, the attacker could read the message, modify the contents, re-encrypt it, then send it on to its intended destination. As you can see, this would be a bad situation because the recipient would receive false information. So this once again highlights the importance of keeping the private key private. Without the private key, the attacker has very few options. I already mentioned that this form of cryptography is common in email usage and we call this non-interactive because one person encrypts and sends the message without the other person participating. There is no constant interaction as is the case with a phone call where two parties are actively communicating at the same time. Using the example of phone calls, and we all know how common cell phone usage is today, some smartphone applications now exist that use a form of asynchronous encryption to encrypt a phone conversation in a similar way as we already discussed with securing email messages. Now, this would be considered an interactive implementation, and though the methodology is slightly different, uh, I won't go into the details here. Suffice it to say that public key cryptography can be used in a variety of ways to secure a variety of communications traffic and it is available to anyone who wants to use it, although it is mostly used by governments and organizations and less by individuals. But the number of private users of encryption is slowly increasing. For the common user at home who wants to use public key cryptography, you will need to install some software on your computer and it may not be as seamless or transparent as you may find in a government office because less applications exist for individual users. A common place to start is to use an implementation uh, named PGP which stands for Pretty Good Privacy. PGP has been around since the early 1990s and uses the public key encryption we have discussed here to encrypt email messages. But it also can be used in symmetric ways to encrypt other data. If you would like to practice using encryption on your own, you can choose from a small handful of different free open source applications that implement PGP, such as OpenPGP or the GNU Privacy Guard for Windows or Linux. It will take a little bit of work to set them up, but once configured, you will be able to privately and securely communicate 
with other people who also use PGP. So you should now understand the concept of public key cryptography and the methodology that can be used to keep common communication data, such as email and phone calls, secure. It is not widely used in everyday private communications, but as the public continues to realize the value of encryption technologies, we will likely see an increase in its usage, though that will probably come at a slower pace than its implementation in corporate and government settings. It is a secure method as long as the private keys remain private, but as with everything in the digital world, the way it is implemented and managed will determine the long-term security it provides. And I encourage you to practice using OpenPGP on your own to get a good hands-on understanding of how it works.